Leo Murphy listened to the cheerful voices and smiled. Laughter drifted in from the slightly open window of the living room. Holly, you remembered. What was the Dean's reaction? He brought it, the fool. Tried to bribe the Dean himself. Mr. Lawrence can't be bribed. He's never done such a thing in his life. Leo smiled. The elderly man carefully took out a tray of succulent fish from the smoker and entered the house. In the spacious cozy room, his friends and relatives were gathered around a huge oval table. Leo, a woman with neatly arranged white hair jumped up from her seat. Set it down who quickly. She cleared a space on the serving table. Why did you carry such a weight by yourself? Dad, seriously, said a tall man in his forties, taking the tray from Leo's hands. Why can't you ever ask for help? Leo smiled, surveying the living room. Loud voices, happy faces, a warm atmosphere, and a generously laid table. Everyone was reminiscing about the past, interrupting and supplementing each other. In about an hour, someone would pick up the guitar and sing an old familiar song, and the rest would gladly join in. Leo Murphy turned 70. To celebrate, their most beloved and close people gathered at their cozy country house, former colleagues, old friends. Looking at the guests, Leo felt a pleasant warmth in his chest. What else could he wish for when Leo's life had turned out even better than he had ever dreamed? He approached his wife and hugged her. Alicia, sit down. I'll handle the fish myself. Oh, stop it. The woman shrugged. It's your birthday. Birthday boy. Sit and relax. We'll take care of everything. One of the daughters-in-law, dark-haired Isabel, appeared nearby. Dad, go mingle with the guests. We'll quickly cut the sturgeon and serve it to everyone. Leo sighed, shook his head his eyes sparkling with happiness, and stepped away. He sat down at his place at the table and joined the debate about which of the current professors at the university was more promising. Leo had spent most of his life working at one of the most prestigious universities, so now the living room was filled with the city's best professors. I'm telling you, Leo was the most talented out of all of us, said a huge man with a wild black beard. I envied him so much. He came literally from the streets, skinny, but with fire in his eyes, and he set his rules, aimed to advance science. The man chuckled, and we all followed suit. Leo playfully punched his friend's shoulder. You, Liam, you're lying, but don't get too cocky. You came from the streets, not me. I've been with our alma mater from the very beginning, and you were the youngest professor in our department. Well, by the time, You'd been a professor for five years already. Well, I'm also ten years older than you. Liam, ten years. The lively debate continued for some time until a knock sounded at the door. Leo and Alicia exchanged surprised glances. Their home was located in a gated community where no one could enter without a call from security. The area was locked down. I'll go check, Leo said stopping his wife. Slipping on his boots and grabbing his jacket, he made his way to the gate along the cleared path. Opening the gate, he glanced around. In the snow stood a tiny moped. Next to it stood a short figure in a motorcycle helmet and a yellow vest with the logo of a courier service. The stranger silently handed over a brightly wrapped box and a tablet. Leo signed and took the box. I wonder, who's this from? thought Leo, and how did he manage to get here on such a rickety thing? Taking the gift, Leo returned to the house. He placed the box on the mantelpiece and rejoined the guests. So, who was it? Asked Alicia. A courier brought a gift. Leo smiled. I'll check it out later. The cozy gathering in the snowy mansion lasted until two in the morning. Loudly bidding farewell and hugging the celebrant and the hostess, the guests began to disperse. Only the Murphy spouses and Leo's assistant, Sean, remained in the house. Alicia, blinking sleepily, headed to the bathroom, while Leo decided to have a herbal tea before bed. Settling by the fireplace, Leo's gaze fell on the courier-delivered gift. Leo took the bright box and carefully unwrapped it. Inside was a smooth, dark wooden box. Lifting the lid, he was surprised. 
On a velvet cushion lay two keys. The square head had a built-in black magnet, and some numbers were engraved on the darkened shaft. Leo turned both keys, but still couldn't understand what it all meant. Lifting the cushion, he found a card at the bottom of the box. On the glossy surface were standard flowers and a calligraphic inscription. Happy birthday. Leo flipped the card and read the text written in clear printed letters. Happy birthday, Mr. Poirot. Well, it's time to get to work for the good of society. You have three days to decipher this quest. Pack your things. You'll be working outside the house. If you fail, you'll regret it dearly. You'll lose the closest people to you, and their lives are priceless. Isn't that so? Leo read the message several times, trying to cope with his astonishment. Mr. Poirot, what the devil? Why would anyone even think to threaten him? The elderly man clenched his hand, crumpling the dangerous card. Leo had experienced ups and downs in his life. Life had thrown him many difficulties, but he had never stooped to treachery. What he had achieved now was earned solely through honest means. So who he could have crossed path. Leo was born into a simple family in the early 50s. Leo's parents worked at one of the city schools. His father was a physics teacher, and his mother was the director's secretary. The family lived in a small one-room apartment in the heart of the city. There was no bathroom in the apartment, and light rarely penetrated through the small windows near the ceiling. However, Leo loved their little cozy home and the small green courtyard overgrown with chestnut and maple trees. The school was close by. Leo's father, Bradley Murphy, had a passion for radio engineering. In the evenings, he would assemble and improve receivers in the tiny kitchen, involving his son in his hobby. From childhood, Leo showed an aptitude for mathematics and technology. So from elementary school, he set himself the goal of getting into one of the most prestigious mathematics faculties. His parents approved of their son's aspirations and tried to help him achieve his dream as much as possible. Leo's childhood and youth could be called happy. The country had almost healed the wounds left by the recent war and was striving towards a bright future. There was a spirit of peace, progress, and new achievements in the air. The youth increasingly leaned towards science. Leo eagerly disassembled and repaired old devices, occasionally bringing home all sorts of junk from the dump. His parents organized joint outings into nature, never refusing to take Leo's friends along. He remembered that time, filled with a constant sense of something joyful, good, and cheerful. And more often than not, that feeling came true. At the age of 17, after finishing school, Leo easily passed exams and became a student. It seemed that nothing else interested the young man in this life except formulas and long chains of numbers. But at the same time, Leo made many new friends among his classmates. He never refused joint gatherings or outings, but the romantic side of life seemed to be a blind spot for him. In faculties of exact sciences, there were traditionally few female students, and those few were in high demand. So the guys from the physics department often cooperated with the humanities faculties for joint activities. Leo couldn't care less about love affairs. Only the sky knows how many maiden hearts were broken because of Leo. The guy always stood out among everyone else. Tall, bright-eyed, with a slightly elongated face and a thick mop of hair. The girls couldn't take their eyes off his handsome face when Leo began to play the guitar a little falsely and hum something quietly to himself. Leo sparkled with humor, capable of initiating playful pranks or organizing spontaneous day trips to the lake. He always had many friends, but, but any flirtation Leo perceived as something alien. No girl could break through to his heart. Leo could turn any romantic gesture into a joke. Therefore, Girls preferred only to be friends with the handsome guy, leaving hopes for love behind. Student life flew by quickly. Lectures, exams, merry gatherings in a friend's apartment, and long works through the city at night. The final year was approaching. Ahead of the students awaited the time for defending their theses and exams. On a hot May day, 
The guys decided to gather and go for a work. The cheerful company quickly noticed a group of freshmen from the art academy. Soon, the guys were getting acquainted with the girls. The young art students looked quite extravagant. They differed from the familiar girls from the humanities department in clothing, behavior, and manner of speaking. There was a certain elusive freedom in their behavior. Leo, who went to get lemonade, returned to the now fully formed group. He introduced himself to the new acquaintances and sat down on a bench. The young man's gaze suddenly caught an ethereal figure. A petite girl could easily get lost among her taller friends. But Leo, catching her gaze, couldn't look away. The girl laughed cheerfully at someone's joke. Dimples appeared on her chubby white cheeks. Her large green eyes sparkled, shaded by light fluffy lashes. She looked like a pastry, a snowy marshmallow. Straight white hair framed her lovely face. She had tied a bright ribbon with an ornament on her forehead. She was dressed in a colorful patchwork dress that reached the floor, revealing round shoulders. Leo was so enchanted by the girl's appearance that he momentarily disconnected from reality. Someone waved a hand in front of his eyes. Hey, dude, are you spaced out? Leo's best friend, Dwayne Carr, teased him with laughter. Oh, no, nothing. Leo suddenly stood up from the bench and approached the object of his attention. Hi. The girl, who had been listening with interest to one of Leo's classmates, smiled briefly and nodded to him. But Leo couldn't calm down. Waiting for the girl's conversation partner to finally fall silent, Leo extended his hand to her. I'm Leo. The girl smiled again. I know, you've already introduced yourself. I'm Alicia. She cautiously placed her palm in Leo's hand. He felt sparks coursing through his whole body. Years passed after that meeting. Lively springs were replaced by cold winters. Cities grew, and the country changed. But Leo still remembered the moment when he realized that his heart was ready to beat faster. But only for this girl. Of course, happiness didn't come immediately. Alicia, accustomed to a completely different circle, categorically rejected Leo's courtship. Listen, just stop following me. Alicia gently pleaded, choose someone else. Do you want me to introduce you to a friend? Almost all of my classmates want to date you, and I'm not in the mood for dating at all. So I can introduce you to someone else if you want. Leo looked piercingly at his dream and shook his head. I don't want to meet your friends. Alicia secretly smiled at such an answer. But outwardly, she remained as cold as ice. Well, well, Dwayne teased. She's such a creative personality and doesn't want to communicate with ordinary models. Well, fine, isn't it? An artist. If we want, all artists' girls will be ours, right? Leo stubbornly lowered his head and continued to awkwardly court his Alicia. The students from the academy watched the unfolding drama and placed their bets. One fine day, Dwayne couldn't resist and ambushed the girl at the entrance to the academy. I'm begging you on my knees. Dwayne emotionally shouted, standing on the asphalt in front of Alicia. Just go on a date with him, will you? He'll flunk his diploma otherwise. Yes, we mathematicians are science people, quite down to earth. But Leo, you know what? Just chat with him a bit longer, and you'll see. He's a great guy. I'm telling you, you won't find anyone like him in the whole world. I can even give you evidence, if you want. Alicia looked surprised at Dwayne. In general, Leo and Dwayne looked alike. Both shaggy, tall, in baggy clothes, and with a slightly absent-minded look. Only Leo attracted attention with his amazing face. Dwayne, on the other hand, looked simpler, although he was also liked by girls. Several passing female students looked at Dwayne, who was kneeling, with interested glances. He winked at them and nodded. Why are you bothering me? What if I don't like him at all? I'm not obligated to date someone I don't like. Dwayne squinted. So, you don't like him? Alicia suddenly blushed. The blush on her fair skin looked slightly painful. It seemed that if you touched the blushing girl, you would definitely get burned. Dwayne chuckled. I see. What do you see? 
leave me alone. Alicia angrily flicked the hem of her long skirt and, lifting her nose, walked around Wayne, right at the entrance to the academy, feeling Wayne's gaze on her. Alicia embarrassingly stumbled and crashed headfirst into the door. Dwayne thought for a moment, got up from the asphalt, dusted off his pants, and, hopping, rushed to Leo. Gloomy Leo sat in the library, staring blankly at a thick book. For the fourteenth time, he tried to grasp the contents of the page and write something down. Leo didn't react to the noisy arrival of his friend nearby. Leo, call her again. She'll definitely agree, Dwayne suggested. Young man, the attractive librarian raised her eyebrows at Dwayne. But I'm whispering, protested the guy. Your whisper can be heard in the neighboring town. The librarian crossed her arms. Tuck outside the reading room. Dwayne rolled his eyes, and Leo silently stuffed his notebooks into his bag and swiftly left. Dwayne followed suit. You're going to her, aren't you? Dwayne peeked over his friend's shoulder and received a poke in the stomach. Ouch. What are you hitting me for? I'm trying to help you. Leo abruptly stopped and looked at his friend. What do you mean you're trying? What have you done? I haven't done anything. Just check something. You know, she blushed when I mentioned you to her. Hey. Dwayne quickly backed away, raising his fists in front of his face. Don't look at me like that. And don't you dare hit me. I'm the future of science. You have no right to damage my bright mind. Ah, ah, my face. Don't touch my beautiful face. Future generations won't forgive you. Having slightly roughed up his friend, Leo calmed down a bit. So, you say she blushed? Yeah, Dwayne said, somewhat disgruntled. You have no conscience at all, Leo. First you hit me, then you talk. It's preventive, Leo replied calmly. Who asked you to go to Alicia anyway? You did. With your pitiful look, you begged me. Go, dear Dwayne, to my beloved. While I'm looking into a book and seeing nothing, I'll never finish my diploma this way. Remembering that scuffle with his best friend, Leo always smiled bitterly. In life, both before and after Dwayne, there were many wonderful people. But someone like Dwayne, lively, a bit scatterbrained, very open, and always ready to help, was only one. Dwayne, who was very difficult to science, endlessly persistent, and very funny. One of a kind. Beautiful Alicia eventually gave Leo the green light. That's why he successfully defended his diploma. Then came a tumultuous and happy time when graduate student Leo was writing his dissertation, working part-time as a mover, and trying to see his beloved Alicia every day. Alicia was either off to plein airs, working on her paintings, or participating in student exhibitions. Time for the girl was becoming scarcer, and Leo suffered, realizing that he couldn't fit into either the bohemian circle or his beloved's tight schedule. At some point, the young couple decided to part ways. They lived in two different worlds. Leo didn't sleep all night, thinking about how to broach the subject. He felt that as soon as he started telling Alicia they needed to break up, frogs would immediately start leaping out of his mouth. How could you say such a thing to someone you love to the point of trembling knees? But Leo understood that things couldn't go on like this. He didn't want to suffer himself and burden Alicia. Finally, after a long break, they met. Leo, seeing his beloved, immediately lost all his resolve. How could he refuse her when she was like this? Walking beside him and chatting. Next week we've been invited to the Clark Museum. There will be an exhibition. Alicia said. Leo stopped. Holding the girl's elbow. That's in another city. Alicia, are you going there? Yeah. Alicia shrugged. After all, it's part of my education too. I have to look at other artists' works. Maybe draw something for myself from them. Alicia, you don't have time to meet with me for half an hour. But you have time to go to another city. For an exhibition. The girl fell silent. Sensing the tension in the air. Leo, I have my own life. Aside from studying and you, you know. No, it's just impossible. 
I think we need to stop seeing each other, Leo said, for the last time, embracing Alicia by her smooth shoulders. Leo shook his head. I don't know. Maybe I won't be able to live like before, without you. But I can't do it this way either. I feel like you're not interested in me. Your soul is always there, among your people. Alicia looked at Leo with sparkling eyes. It felt like someone huge and heavy had stepped on her heart with muddy boots. I, I don't know what to say. I'm just me. You've seen it all. Alicia bit her low lip and turned away. I'll go. Good luck, Leo. Leo immersed himself in his studies. He spent days and nights sitting at his desk, frightening the rare students peeking into the department with his wild appearance. Leo's face was overgrown with a scruffy, unkempt beard, which changed his remarkable face unrecognizably. He rarely appeared at home. His parents watched with concern as their son's appearance deteriorated. Once Leo's mother tried to drag him to the barber shop, but the tall and strong Leo broke free and headed towards the university. After that, Leo didn't come home for almost two weeks, so his parents stopped trying to improve their son's appearance, rejoicing in his rare presence in the apartment. Dwayne shook his head, watching what was happening. But you said yourselves that you are not a good match. What's with this theatrical suffering now? Leo waved him off, unwilling to explain something he himself didn't fully understand. It seemed like he initiated the breakup himself. But there was still a feeling that Alicia was waiting for Leo to take that step, not daring to do it herself. Alicia seemed outwardly calm. She continued to pursue her creative endeavors, becoming one of the most promising students. Her mentor, the renowned artist Joshua Pearson, approvingly patted Alicia on the back, looking at her latest completed work. Alicia, you definitely have talent. You'll go far. Don't lose your gift. Don't you dare. You know what extinguishes the spark. What? Alicia respectfully caught every word of her teacher. All this stuff that you, women, love so much. Getting married. Having kids. Cooking dinners. And ironing curtains. You understand, Alicia. If that sucks you in, there won't be any further paths. You'll just end up trapped at these words. Alicia's heart painfully constricted. Of course, she wanted to paint. She dreamed of her art. But couldn't you be both an artist, a wife, and a mother? The girl wasn't sure she was ready to give up such an important part of life. However, she didn't argue with her mentor. I'll just work my own path. The girl stubbornly fought and immersed herself in her work with renewed vigor. Several months had passed. Alicia thought that this time was enough to forget about the failed romance with Leo. But it wasn't the case. With everyone who cotted her, the girl saw discrepancies. She compared each one to Leo, and no one could measure up to the standard set by him. One guy seemed not handsome enough to her, because Leo had a stunning face and figure. Another guy didn't shine with intellect, but Leo was a genius. Then the new suitor didn't match Leo's height, but Leo was tall. Alicia remembered that she was a little burdened by her relationship with Leo, because he wanted too much from her. Time, attention, a serious approach, and it seemed like she didn't mind breaking up. But now all this seemed so silly. I mean, she broke up with such a wonderful guy just because he wanted to see her more often. Damn it, Alicia fought, returning to the dorm after another gathering. Why did he get stuck in my head like that? On one of the benches in the snowy square she was passing through, there was a hunched figure. Alicia glanced at the person and her heart sank. Leo. The girl thought. The person on the bench didn't look like Leo. He was unkempt, with long, tangled hair that reached below his shoulders. His face was covered in uneven stubble. Leo, while not the epitome of neatness, always looked pleasant to the eye. Certainly not like this bent-over guy. This was some vagrant or a local drunk. The girl convinced herself. But Alicia's legs took her to the bench. She scrutinized the pale face for several long seconds, finally convinced that it was indeed Leo Murphy before her. Leo, 
What happened to you? Alicia stood before the bowed head of the guy. He didn't respond, just covered his face with his hands and hunched over even more. Leo, are you drunk? Are you injured? From somewhere in the bushes, Dwayne Kai merged with a bottle of soda in his hands. Seeing Alicia, he froze, then cautiously approached, pulling the girl by the elbow. She obediently followed with Leo's best friend. Alicia, he's not in the best period right now. I won't tell you how he's been dealing with your breakup all this time. But right now the situation is even worse. Alicia, Dwayne said, much worse. It's just a disaster. Why? Alicia threw a worried glance at Leo. Dwayne sighed. It turns out that Leo's parents decided to go to Aspen. The not-so-old couple was so happy about it. They were beaming. They had long been concerned about their son's behavior, who looked gloomy and rarely showed up at home, only to change clothes. The joint trip seemed to be a breath of fresh air for them. Leo's parents would be able to distract themselves from their routine work and worries about their son. The spouses were parking, infecting even the gloomy Leo with their enthusiasm. He perked up a bit, looking at his suddenly rejuvenated and hugging parents. The vacation dates coincided with the winter break at the school where both spouses worked. After parking their belongings and giving valuable instructions to their son, Leo's parents went on vacation. Both Leo's mother and father were people of their time. They were passionate about sports. Both excelled at skiing, and in their youth, they went on several challenging mountain hikes. Now they were heading to celebrate New Year's surrounded by majestic mountains. They planned to ski down snowy slopes and, of course, reminisce about their youth. Who could have guessed that it would all end in tragedy? They and several others got caught in a mountain trap and were buried under an avalanche. The holiday turned into a disaster. Leo simply couldn't believe that his kind, wise, cheerful parents were no more. The tragedy was compounded by the fact that rescuers spent a long time searching for the deceased, scattered under tons of snow. Leo could consider himself lucky because his parents were eventually found and sent home and he was able to accompany his loved ones on their final journey. He hasn't been eating or drinking normally for several days now. Dwayne shook a bottle in front of Alicia. I want to try to feed him while he's weak, because he usually fights it off. The funerals drained the remaining strength from the young man. So now Leo was in a strange stupor, in a state between reality and delirium. Leo heard Alicia and Dwayne's voices, but couldn't understand if it was happening in reality. He felt someone pulling him by the hand, leading him somewhere, shouldering the burden. After some time, Leo realized he was lying on something soft, caught the scent of his mother's favorite perfume, and the faint smell of soldering, which was always present in their small apartment. Leo sank into darkness. When he opened his eyes, he saw the familiar ceiling above him. The air was filled with the scent of food, and soft classical music played from a small radio. Leo rubbed his face and got up. For a moment, it seemed to him that everything that had happened recently was just a terrible dream, and that his mother would appear any moment now, calling him and his father for dinner. But his guys quickly caught onto the joint photograph of his parents that Leo hung on the wall after their funeral. Yes, all this had indeed happened and he was completely alone in this world. Muffled voices came from the kitchen. Leo quickly washed his face. Then he followed the sound of conversation. In the tiny kitchen, Dwayne was grabbing pieces of potato directly from the pot. Alicia stood nearby, looking displeased. Dwayne, get your hands off. Let me cook in peace. Get out of here, she said. Leo blinked a few times. You. What are you doing here? He stared at Alicia as if he had seen a ghost. The girl turned around and froze in embarrassment. Indeed, why was she here? They had long since broken up. Alicia herself was the reason for their failed relationship. Then what was her presence here for? Brother, brother, go to your room. We'll bring everything in now. We'll eat and discuss everything, Dwayne said. Leo lingered at the doorway for a moment then turned around and left, and Dwayne breathed a sigh of relief. 
At least now his friend looked a little more alive than he had in the past few days. In the middle of the table on a round stand stood a large pot emitting a tantalizing aroma. Next to it on a plate were pieces of fried bacon and bread. Come on, eat. Dwayne pushed the plate closer to Leo. You haven't eaten for several days. Eat, I say, brother. Leo suddenly felt his mouth watering. He grabbed a fork and started eating greedily, avoiding looking at Alicia. After satisfying his hunger, Leo leaned back in his chair. By that time, Dwayne had quietly left the apartment, leaving Leo and Alicia alone. Why did you come? Leo asked again. Because you are not doing well. The girl simply replied. Well, I'll manage somehow. Leo stubbornly shook his head. I know. Alicia rested her cheek on her hand. I know you'll manage. But you don't have to do it alone, Leo. Alicia seamlessly and calmly re-entered Leo's life as if it were the only right thing to do. Alicia moved her things from the dormitory and settled into the run-down apartment with Leo. A month later, the young couple got married. Dwayne, as the groom's friend, got so drunk at the wedding that the newlyweds had to lay him on the floor in their tiny apartment on their wedding night. Previously, Alicia thought that Leo would hinder her creativity, restrain her impulses, and that their relationship would restrict her artistic endeavors. But it turned out that when you live next to your loved one, everything happens exactly the opposite. Alicia's work gained a new depth previously inaccessible to her. Her mentor was amazed at the progress of his pupil. Alicia, you're blossoming before my eyes, Pearson approvingly said. Are you in love? Being in love is good. It's wonderful. Just remember, Alicia, what I told you, I got married. Alicia replied with a soft smile. And it turns out, it's not so bad. Pearson shifted his surprised gaze from the student to her new painting. Well, Alicia, everyone has their own path. Years passed. Alicia graduated from the academy with honors and actively worked on joining the artists' union. Leo defended his dissertation and remained working at his alma mater, combining teaching and scientific activities. There were joys, sorrows, difficulties, and achievements ahead. They bought their first comfortable apartment. Leo's parents' small apartment turned into an art studio. Then Alicia gave birth to their first child, Alfie. Leo became an associate professor, and Alicia joined the artist union. When you are young, all difficulties seem surmountable and all sorrows temporary. But there are events that are irreversible and dreadful. When Leo turned 34, they already had two children, the eldest Alfie and the younger Ollie. Alicia was pregnant for the third time. Let's stop here, his wife said. After all, I have to think about work. Leo nodded in agreement. He was glad that his headstrong Alicia had agreed to have three children at all. Folk omens pointed to the fact that this time they would have a girl. So, it really might be a good place to stop. And then came that cursed business trip that deprived Leo of a very important person in his life. Leo shook his head, pushing away painful memories. He once again held two strange keys in his hands. Now, at the age of 70, when he should be enjoying a well-deserved peaceful golden period of life, someone appears who wants to harm his loved ones. And he cannot allow that. He just can't. The children have long been living their own lives. Leo and Alicia have four grandsons and three granddaughters. Can they afford to let some mysterious villain intrude into their family? The man quickly typed out messages on his phone. After a few minutes, his assistant Sean quietly appeared in the living room. Leo briefly explained the situation and handed the box he received from the ominous stranger to his assistant. Sean Newman entered the Murphy family's life about five years ago. By that time, Leo had already retired from teaching and immersed himself fully in a new passion. Leo, a mathematician, could never have imagined that he would radically change his field of work one day. It all started on his 62nd birthday. The Murphys had their own tradition for about 10 years before that. A little game of daring. Every birthday, Alicia challenged Leo. Over the years, 
They had flown in a hot air balloon, parachuted, gone to the sea, and done many other exciting things. Each time, Alicia came up with something new, and now Leo was eagerly awaiting what his wife would propose. Returning home after classes, Leo eagerly entered the living room. In the middle of the round table was a fairly large gift box. Well, are you ready? Alicia approached her husband from behind and hugged him. Ready. Leo said joyfully, rubbing his hands, approaching the table. What's in there? Well, take a look. She smiled. Leo didn't hesitate and opened the box. Inside was a heavy vintage typewriter. Write a book for me. Alicia laughed. This is my challenge to you. Daring enough. Me. Write a book. Leo glanced at the bulky typewriter on the table. But, dear, I'm... I'm a mathematician. Exactly. You've been stuck in your science. I think it's time to try something new. You'll write the book, and I'll take care of getting it published. Or is it still not daring enough? Leo then pressed a few tight buttons on the typewriter with a loud clack. My dear, but who uses these nowadays? We have computers. He said, it's just a symbol. You don't have to type on it at all. Alicia sat down on the couch. I'm just really curious about what you'll write. This challenge mark at the beginning of it all. Leo approached the task with utmost seriousness. After all, he had never once declined his wife's challenges and had always accepted them. Every evening, he sat down at his laptop and diligently typed away. The typewriter proudly stood on a special round table in his office, symbolizing a new endeavor. Alicia circled around her husband, trying to peek over his shoulder. Just bear with me a little. Leo gently pushed his wife away. You'll see everything when I'm done. Finally, ten months later, Leo handed his wife a thick stack of pages bound in a plastic cover. For two consecutive days, Alicia read her husband's creation almost non-stop, and when she finished, she approached Leo and hugged him. You know, you're absolutely unbearable. Why? Leo was surprised. Alicia nodded towards the manuscript lying on the table. Because for so many years, you've hidden your talent from me. Leo, this, this is absolutely amazing. A real captivating detective story. Seriously. Leo rubbed his nose. Well, don't exaggerate, Alicia. I really mean it, darling. When I said I'd take care of publishing, I planned to just order one copy of your book at the printing press. But now I think we should send your manuscript to a publishing house. It's truly very talented. At first, Leo didn't want to seriously consider writing. But really, what harm could it do for a mathematics professor? Nevertheless, Alicia sent the book to one of the publishing houses, and soon they received a response. Leo was offered to publish his work, and they even suggested signing a contract for the next book. The professor hesitated. Alicia insisted. In the end, a representative from the publishing house came directly to the Murphy family's home. He calmly explained to the shocked Leo that he was missing out on a gift given to him and that the professor needed to understand for himself whether writing brought him pleasure. And if so, why would he refuse? Leo thought about it and concluded that yes, he did enjoy creating text, and he didn't even understand how it happened. But soon he was already writing another detective novel. Moreover, this occupation so captivated him that Leo began to consider finally leaving his teaching job and immersing himself entirely in this new endeavor. After completing his duties at the university, Leo solemnly retired, continuing to write book after book. The print runs grew larger. The Murphy name was now known not only among academia. He couldn't believe that such a trivial activity could also bring in money. However, the children and friends supported the former professor in his endeavor. Thus, by the age of 65, Leo Murphy became a best-selling author. It was then that Alicia suggested hiring an assistant. The thing was, since Leo specialized in detective stories, he had to study quite a lot of materials in various fields to make the narrative sound plausible. Sometimes the information from the internet wasn't enough, 
so he had to go and study some aspects firsthand. Alicia worried when he went to remote places to learn something new on his own. That's why Leo's wife insisted on hiring an assistant. Sean was still under 30 at the time. He had worked in the police force for a while, but unfortunately had to resign due to unfortunate circumstances. It wasn't because Sean suffered a serious injury or injured someone else. It was just that the young and promising officer, who aspired to climb the ranks, didn't sit well with someone higher up in the chain of command. So, Sean constantly received backlash from his superiors, deciding he didn't want to tolerate it anymore and didn't have the strength to fight back. Sean resigned. He was in the midst of searching for a new opportunity when an acquaintance recommended him as an assistant to a detective fiction writer. Sean and the Murphy family immediately hit it off. The assistant eagerly explored new areas alongside his boss. He was tasked with ensuring Leo's safety and assisting him with any professional matters. Moreover, Sean enjoyed living in the mansion and embracing nature. Moving from his small apartment, Sean breathed a sigh of relief. The young man didn't have a fiancé or even a girlfriend yet. Short romantic flings quickly fizzled out. So, Sean wasn't concerned about living in the same house as two elderly people. Reading the threatening postcard, Sean frowned. All right, Leo, we need to contact the police. Even if this is someone's sick joke, we can't take any risks. Exactly. Leo slammed his fist on the armrest of the chair. We can't take any risks. I have a wife, children, and grandchildren. I have to sort this out myself. You stay and keep an eye on the house and Alicia. Furthermore, we need to hire security for my children's families. And I, no, no, no. Leo, Sean interrupted. Hiring security is a good idea, of course. But you won't be dealing with this culprit alone. The men argued quietly for a while. In the end, Leo had to concede. Sean quickly called his friend, the owner of a security company, and arranged protection for all the members of the writer's family. All white. Right. What's next? Leo looked at the strange keys again. Let's say, these numbers. Obviously, they're coordinates. Well, yes, Sean nodded. Let's start by checking where they lead us. The man brought a laptop and quickly entered the numbers from the key. The point on the map pointed to a city in the north. All right. Let's take a closer look. Sean scrolled the mouse wheel. Here, there's a building. The Fox's Den Hotel. That's where we need to go. Apparently. Leo nodded. Well, Sean, book the tickets. Early in the morning. Alicia was surprised to find her husband parking a suitcase. Where are you going? The woman squinted. I don't recall you having any plans. Well, they came up. Leo evasively replied. I need to go somewhere. It's about the new book. Nothing major. Alicia shot her husband a penetrating look. So, all of a sudden, there's a need to go somewhere. Leo, what's going on? The woman... Hearing the commotion, peeked out the window. And who are those men in black in our yard? Tell me. Well, that's security. Leo hesitated. The situation, you know, is unsettled. I'm afraid to leave you alone. Alicia flared up. What? You used to leave me alone before. And now suddenly you hired security. Quickly tell me what happened. Ha, huh, darling. Leo kissed his wife's cheek. I'll explain everything later, but there's no time now. Just trust me, there's nothing to worry about. I've got to go. My flight leaves in three hours. I going. Grabbing his suitcase, Leo shamefully fled the marital bedroom, leaving Alicia outraged. Flopping into the car seat, Leo waved to Sean, who was behind the wheel. Faster, faster, let's go. The assistant started the engine and pulled away glancing sideways at his boss. Are you running away from your wife? What nonsense. Leo turned to the window. We're just running late. Safely reaching their destination, the men exited the airport building and hailed a taxi, instructing the driver to take them to the Fox's Den Hotel. The building, resembling a large cottage, 
was surrounded by snow-covered pine trees, with frosty air around and a piercingly blue sky completing the fairy tale scene. Leo got out of the taxi and looked around. The hotel grounds were very spacious. In the distance, Individual cottages built in the same style as the main building were visible. It's a shame we're brought here under such circumstances. I wish Alicia could see this beauty. Leo sighed. Well, once we deal with the threats, you can bring your wife here. Sean nodded approvingly. He also liked the view. After walking along the cleared path paved with wooden stones, the men entered the building. Inside, it smelled of resin, herbs, and wood shavings. At the end of a small cozy lobby was the reception desk. Hello, we need two rooms. Good afternoon. The friendly middle-aged woman smiled at the guests. Did you have a reservation? Yes, we did. Sean calmly replied and gave the booking number. Leo looked approvingly at the man. Hiring such a competent employee was indeed a wise decision. After settling into their rooms, the men met at the restaurant on the hotel's ground floor, ordering food. They began discussing their next steps. So, Leo, if the sender of the package lured you here, he must show up, Sean said confidently. The note said I only have three days. Leo nervously twirled the fork in his fingers. And the first day is already coming to an end, and I'm feeling very uneasy. The young man gazed thoughtfully out of the window where the bright white snow sparkled in the lamplight. Occasionally, small snowflakes fell from the sky, softly settling into the fluffy drifts. The restaurant was warm and cozy, with a crackling fire in the large fireplace and soft, pleasant music playing. The atmosphere was conducive to peace and tranquility. However, circumstances prevented them from fully enjoying the moment. Leo, have you ever been to this city? Sean asked. Leo squinted in response, recalling, Yes, I've been here. It wasn't the most pleasant trip, I'll tell you that. My best friend died during a business trip. Sean lowered his eyes. Oh, I'm sorry. Leo, I didn't mean to bring up something so heavy. I just don't understand why they sent you here specifically. There must be something related to this place. Please, Tell me more about why you came here and when. The waitress approached the table and smilingly set plates in front of the men. Leo absent-mindedly stirred his soup with a spoon and began his story. In general, it was a routine business trip, one of many conferences he had to attend. However, Leo didn't want to go because Olisha was in the final stages of her pregnancy. He had argued with the dean for a long time explaining that he couldn't participate due to family circumstances. Leo, don't throw a tantrum. The dean slammed his hand on the table. Our women give birth somehow, and yours will too. And your help won't be needed here. And what about my two children, who will take care of them while I'm away and Olisha is giving birth? Asked the grand mithers to babysit. Finally, the dean waved it official. Leo paled and clenched his fists. We don't have grandmothers. My parents are dead, and Olisha grew up in an orphanage. If you want to fire me, go ahead, but I'm not going. The dean cleared his throat, realizing he had said too much. At that moment, Dwayne burst into the office with the commotion. Mr. Baba, don't worry about Leo. Dwayne plopped down on a chair and stretched out his long legs. I'll go to the conference. No problem. Hold on. What do you mean? I'll go. The dean frowned. Leo is supposed to speak there on his work topic. Answer questions. He's already listed as a speaker. You know, so what? We work together on the first part. So I know some questions. I can answer. Dwayne pointed at Leo. Leo, give me your presentation. I'll study it in advance. If there's anything you don't understand, I'll ask. All right. Dwayne then turned to the dean. Mr. Baba, leave the young father alone. And why am I listed as a conference participant if I wasn't even informed? Leo asked. That's not right. You're making these decisions as if any employee can just take off to the north. Mr. Baba, just look at this manual he's about to explode with indignation. 
Dwayne continued to persuade the Dean. How will you explain his disappearance to his wife? It's different with me. For example, I'm completely free, unburdened by family. I'm ready for any adventures and escapades. The Dean sighed heavily and reluctantly agreed. Listen, Dwayne, you're a true friend. Leo slapped him on the back as they left the Dean's office. If it weren't for you, then, oh, stop it. Dwayne casually threw his hands behind his head. Walking down the corridor, I'll go, have some fun, soak up the northern romance. At the appointed time, Dwayne Carr boarded the train and headed to that northern city for the conference. The event lasted a week. After his presentation, the mathematician happily called Leo to report that everything went well. I still have some business here, Dwayne said mysteriously. I met someone. I think this is it, the real thing. I'll tell you all about it later, honestly. Dwayne, who did you meet? What's with the secrets? Did you answer the questions, RK there? Did anyone ask why you were speaking and not me? Leo inquired. Hey, the connection is bad. There's some clicking and buzzing. Dwayne replied. I can't hear anything. Leo, I'll be back soon and we'll talk. Don't worry. Everything's fine. This was Leo and Dwayne's final conversation. Two days later, the conference participants went fishing. Then Leo received dreadful news. His best friend drowned. Dwayne's body was never found. And Leo blamed himself for the rest of his life. If only he hadn't refused to go on the business trip, Dwayne would still be alive. Anyway, I didn't come right away when I found out. Leo sighed heavily concluding his story. Alicia was actually in the hospital at the time. She went into labor early. Our Violet arrived in the eighth month. When Alicia was discharged, seeing my condition, she suggested going to that city. I came. I walked on the shore where the ill-fated fishing took place. The places there are wooded, and the riverbanks are gentle, but the current is strong. How no one noticed Dwayne's disappearance. I don't understand, Leo said. Were they all drinking there? Then his jacket and boot were washed ashore downstream. Well, I think he slipped. Sean, maybe hit his head on something there. No one saw him and couldn't save him. Oh, what can you do? And Dwayne had no relatives left. So I just erected a memorial obelisk on the river bank. As I couldn't bury my friend anyway. And after the legal time had passed, he was declared dead. Then we did everything there, in his hometown. We did everything as it should be. After Leo's story, Sean pondered, strange coincidence. You were summoned to this city specifically, weren't you? It seems like nothing connects you with him except for that old tragedy. We need to thoroughly investigate this, Leo. If this story resurfaced, it means it matters. In any case, one of the keys had coordinates to this hotel, so we need to find the right lock. Leo then pulled out the key. Both men examined it for a while. It's antique, Sean said, and small in size. It looks more like a key to a cupboard or dresser than to a door. For example, it can't be for a cupboard in another room. Still, the task must be solvable, Leo. So we need to inspect all common areas. Let's take a tour of the hotel, Leo suggested, and his assistant nodded in agreement. The men settled the bill and stepped out into the lobby again. There was a different woman at the reception desk, much younger than the previous one. Hello. Sean greeted politely. Good evening. The girl smiled. Her bright green eyes sparkled with joy. Can I help you? Yes. Dear. You have such a wonderful hotel. Thank you. The girl said. It's really very beautiful here. Yes. Yes. Very beautiful. Sean replied. And the architecture is so unusual. And the grounds are very picturesque. We would like to explore here. Is that possible? The man glanced at the badge hanging on the girl's chest. Vivian? Perhaps you could give us a little tour. The young woman nodded and turned towards the entrance to the utility room. Mrs. Wilkerson, could you man the front desk for a bit? I'll show the guests around and explain what we have here. 
she said. A staff member who had checked in Leo and Sean appeared in the doorway. Of course, dear, Mrs. Wilkerson smiled. Go ahead, I'll stay here. Vivian quickly threw on a wool coat over her shoulders and stepped out. Follow me. The girl led the men behind her. First, I'll show you our winter garden. Leading the guests to the top floor, Vivian pushed open the double doors, revealing a spacious hall. Part of the roof was made in the form of a huge window, allowing sunlight to pour in during the day. Numerous plants and miniature trees filled the air with a moist woody scent. Cute benches with wrought iron decor, round small tables, and wicker chairs were scattered around. So, dear guests, here you can have coffee or breakfast, Vivian explained. You just need to make a reservation in advance. The girl pointed to a tall, slender tree, and this is a real cherry blossom from Japan. One of our guests gave it to us. The men looked around the garden, admiring the beauty of the plants. The girl then took them through the other common areas, showing and explaining what guests could do during their stay at the hotel. Come on, let me show you the living room. Vivian led the men and took them to the third floor. In a very large room, cozy like the restaurant downstairs, a fireplace was burning. There was a billiard table here. Several men were casually playing. Along one of the walls stretched shelves lined with books. Leo approached them and started flipping through the spines. Would you look at that? Leo pulled out a chubby volume. Didn't expect to find something like this here. Vivian glanced briefly at the book, her face taking on a cold expression. She muttered to herself, What's this filth doing here? And Sean didn't miss it. He quickly read the title of the book, then glanced at the author, Murphy L. It said on the book. Sean raised an eyebrow. What a strange reaction from the girl. The assistant made a subtle gesture to his boss. Leo understood that it wasn't worth broadcasting that he was the author of the book. Do you not like detective stories? Sean asked Vivian. Why wouldn't I? The girl smiled. Oh, I just thought you didn't like this book. I don't like its author, not the book itself, said Vivian behind her back. Leo widened his eyes in surprise. What had he done to offend this stranger in this distant city? And why is that? May I ask? Sean carefully returned the book to its place. Oh, the girl hesitated. He's just a bad person. But it's not important. In Vivian's pocket, her mobile phone rang. She quickly picked up the receiver. Then, after a short conversation, apologized to the guests. Sorry. I need to go back, she said with an embarrassed smile. I've shown you everything, especially since it's already dark. It's better to see the grounds outside in the morning. The men thanked Vivian and said goodbye to her. Sean watched her leave and then turned to Leo. Oh, interesting, he said. Why does she think you're a bad person? Boss, you're not hiding anything from me, are you? Stop it. Leo waved his hand. Of course, I'm not hiding anything. I was in this city a hundred years ago, hardly interacted with anyone, and certainly couldn't have offended this girl in any way. I don't think she was even born then. Boss, listen, let's check your key. Sean took the key with the cutout numbers from Leo and began inserting it into numerous keyholes one by one. Finally, there was a click. Carefully, the man pulled out a drawer. Leo came closer. Inside lay a simple cardboard box the size of a cigarette pack. Sean cautiously took out the box and looked up at Leo. So, let's return to your room. And Leo nodded, seated at the coffee table. The men silently looked at each other. Both felt some unease. Finally, Sean slowly opened the box. Inside was a rolled up piece of paper. Underneath it lay a simple amber brooch in the shape of a grape cluster. Leo took the sheet from his assistant and enfolded it. Congratulations, Sherlock. You found the first clue. Look at this thing. Doesn't it remind you of anything? Does your conscience bother you anywhere? I'm giving you a chance. If you don't correct it, at least try to redeem your sin a little. Use the second key where your game began. Many years ago, Leo read the strange note aloud several times. 
The brooch did seem familiar to him, but he couldn't quite grasp the fleeting memory. Where had he seen it? Meanwhile, Sean was puzzled. So, what's with this set of words? I don't understand. Watson is being referred to. Boss, if you are hiding something from me, I'm not hiding anything. Leo said. Let me think. I definitely saw this brooch somewhere. But where? Leo closed his eyes, trying to remember. Meanwhile, Sean examined the jewelry in his hands. It's clearly not valuable. Just an ordinary amber brooch. Looks like typical costume jewelry. Where do they mainly mine amber in New Jersey? New Jersey. Yes. Leo mumbled without opening his eyes. And Dwayne Carr was born there. Leo suddenly jumped up. Sean, exactly. Did you remember something? Sean stared at his boss. Yes. 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 It's the brooch. He snatched it from his assistant's hands. It's this one. Before Leo's mind's eye flashed memories. He had seen it five or six times. Dwayne always carried it with him, pinned to the inside of his sleeve. It was his talisman. The only thing Dwayne inherited from his mother, who died of peritonitis when he was ten years old. After that, little Dwayne wandered among distant relatives, eventually ending up in an orphanage. The talented guy managed to get into a good college, successfully graduated, and pursued a career in science. And he came here, to this city, to a conference many years ago, Dwayne Carr. He didn't show this brooch to anyone in particular, but it was always with him. And I, as his best friend, knew its significance. He said he would give this item to his chosen one one day. And until then, he would always carry it with him as a blessing from his late mother. Leo became agitated. But where? Sean. Where could it have come from? Leo grabbed his head with his hands. And exactly, listen, if he never parted with it, then the brooch should have rested somewhere at the bottom of the river. But why is it here? Sean fought and furrowed his brow. So he wanted to give it to his chosen one. Maybe he did give it in the end, shortly before his death. Ha! Huh. Leo opened his mouth, but he said he met someone here. He called and was in such a joyful mood promising to tell everything later, but that never happened. The men looked at each other, not knowing what to do next. It turns out, all this strange business is related to Dwayne. Leo sighed deeply. Ah, but since his death, Sean, it's been 35, almost 36 years. Why now? And what could all this mean? I can't find. Sean ran his hand through his hair. You know, I was puzzled by that girl's reaction. Vivian, when she saw your book, boss, remember, she said you were not a good person. Perhaps it's worth looking into. I'll go try to chat with her. The man jumped to his feet and left the room. Leo remained sitting in the armchair, feeling utterly drained. He was 70 years old. He had lived a long, interesting life. In general, he planned to enjoy at least another 10 years of well-deserved rest surrounded by a loving family and, of course, friends. But now Leo felt completely devastated. The forgotten past suddenly burst open with a crash and intruded into his cozy everyday world. The sense of guilt, doled over the years, pierced the elderly man's heart again like a sharp knife. How did Wayne spend these last days? Whom did he meet? Whom did he leave his mother's legacy to? Leo suddenly groaned painfully. He felt the pain of losing his friend again. Moreover, now that he knew how full and rich life could be, the thought that Dwayne died without experiencing much, very much, pierced him even more sharply. Leo remembered the intense emotions he experienced when his children were born. How wonderful were the evenings spent with his beloved woman. How pleasant and joyful it was to watch the growing children. The children became more independent, flew out of the parental nest, started their own families. Leo felt again the pleasant excitement he had when his eldest son announced that he would have a grandchild. A grandchild. And all this Dwayne could no longer experience, understand, or feel. Sean returned to the room. Well, Vivian will only be available tomorrow morning. 
the assistant disappointedly announced. Boss, let's get some sleep. Ha. Huh. And still, what did he mean when he wrote where he started his game many years ago? Leo muttered, boss. Boss, tomorrow. Everything's tomorrow. Sean was adamant. Go to bed. If you give yourself a heart attack, your wife will kill me. Understand? Leo sighed and went to prepare for sleep. The next morning, Sean, without visiting his boss, went down to the reception desk. Vivian was not there yet, so the man settled into a comfortable chair in the lobby, lazily watching the people passing by. After about 20 minutes, a man in a business suit entered the lobby. He approached the reception desk and asked something to the administrator. She answered and turned the screen of her laptop to him. Interesting. Probably someone from the hotel management, Sean thought. At that moment, Vivian entered the hotel. Seeing the man at the front desk, she almost skipped over to him and hugged him. And he patted the girl on the head and exchanged a few words with her. Then, smiling, the man left. Sean approached Vivian, who was just taking off her airy white coat. Hello. He greeted the girl. Good morning. Vivian responded. How are you finding it here? Will you go see the grounds today? Yes, of course, of course we will. Said Sean. Are you working today too? No, I have a day off, but I need to quickly send some documents. So I came in. Vivian explained. What do you think about having lunch together? Sean asked, pausing for her response. Vivian's guys called. So you're here for a no strings attached romance? No, no, not at all. The man was calm. I just wanted to ask you something. I'm not the type to start intrigues. Believe me, the girl still looked wary. And what do you want to ask then? Well, you see, it's a bit delicate. I really don't intend to bother you, even though you're a very attractive girl. Especially since I can see very well that I'm not of interest to you. Sean chuckled. And you've just hugged another man. Would I dare flirt so shamelessly with a woman who's already in a relationship? Well, Vivian hesitated. Okay, then... Let's meet here at one o'clock. Do you want to have lunch at our restaurant? I'd rather not. You work here. It wouldn't be very convenient. I suggest we go somewhere in the city. Well, okay. Vivian nodded. See you. Leo had just woken up. The elderly man called his wife. Alicia, are you okay there? Leo asked, his heart pounding. I'm fine. But what about you? Alicia's voice carried a stern tone. You left somewhere without explaining anything. Alicia, I'll definitely tell you everything. Just take care of yourself and listen to the security. You listen to them yourself. She breathed discontentedly into the phone. Okay, that's it. I have things to do. Call me if you finally want to explain everything to me. The call ended. Then there was a knock on the door. Leo let Sean into the room and went to the bathroom to wash up. Meanwhile, the assistant reread the note from the stranger and carefully examined the brooch, finding nothing new for himself. The man patiently waited for his boss and briefly conveyed his conversation with Vivian. I don't know what you want from her. She definitely has nothing to do with this. Sean, Leo remarked. Well, maybe not directly, Sean retorted. But, you see, Leo, I feel like there's some connection. Let's think about what was meant in the note. Where did the game begin? Well, if we assume that during his time here, Dwayne had a romance with someone, and such a serious one that he gave his precious brooch to his beloved, where did all this begin? Leo sighed. How can we even find out? How? He didn't have time to tell me anything. And the main question is, why am I even involved in this? Why does this mysterious sender accuse me of something? Does he think I'm responsible for Dwayne's death? Well, suppose I think so too. Leo grimaced painfully. Oh, Sean, if only it weren't for me. All right, boss, stop it. I know the whole story, and there's no guilt on your part here. Obviously, there's something else going on here. Leo, by the way, did your friend leave any belongings behind? Well, of course, 
He lived in an apartment, so there were his books, clothes, some odds and ends. We took it all to the department, left some things there as a keepsake. Dwayne didn't have any relatives. Sean shook his head. No, no, I mean not that. The man gestured around the room. Here, in this city. He stayed somewhere during the conference. Right. Where? At a hotel. Who took his belongings from there? And Leo fell into thought. Well, listen, I don't know. At least I didn't take them. And I arrived here a month after his death. Most likely, the police took them. Sean picking up the brooch from the table. Leo, allow me. I'll borrow it for a while. He got up. You think it over. And I'll still have a chat with this Vivian. Leo absent-mindedly nodded at Sean. Vivian nervously waited in the lobby. Sean looked at the girl from a distance. She certainly attracted attention. Sean was used to different women. Bright, confident, loudly declaring themselves. And Vivian had a certain delicacy about her. Porcelain delicate skin. Blue veins on her temples. Slightly wavy hair casually pinned up. A face without makeup. Bright green eyes. Long lashes. Pale lips. A slightly upturned nose. Petite hands. Without a manicure. If Sean hadn't been here by the force of unfortunate circumstances, he would have definitely been interested in such a girl. The man immediately remembered the stranger Vivian had hugged and bitterly smirked. However, she already had a relationship. So what's the point of all these thoughts? Sean approached the girl. Well, ready. He smiled. Vivian nodded in response. And they headed for the exit. The young man had already ordered a taxi in advance. So they quickly reached the city center. I've booked a table at a local cuisine restaurant. Oh, you're probably tired of local dishes. Why didn't I think of it right away? The man muttered, not at all. I love our cuisine very much. Vivian smiled at him. Let's go then. After placing their order, they looked around in silence for a while. Vivian, why did you say that the writer Leo Murphy is a bad person? Sean suddenly said. She blinked. This question clearly caught her off guard. Why does that concern you? You're a journalist, right? The girl squinted. No, not really. It just so happens that I know him. And your statement surprised me. He, believe me, doesn't look like a bad person. Oh, Vivian exhaled, furrowing her brows angrily. Of course he doesn't look like one. A model family man, a professor, three children, lots of merits, writes books. Sean was slightly taken aback, but still nodded slowly. Well, overall, yes, he has a good family. He was into science. Now he writes. That's all true. But what's so awful about that? Vivian, this what she almost shouted. Do you know that he deceived a simple girl? Said he would marry her, but lied. He was already married at that time, and he already had children. She believed him, waited, and suffered. Sean felt that all this sounded somehow strange. If Leo ever had an affair on the side, it would be difficult for him to admit it, even to Sean. After all, it was such a delicate matter. Vivian, where did you get this information from? And are you sure about it? The girl took a sharp sip from her glass and placed it on the table with a bang. I'm sure because this girl is my mother and she wouldn't make this up. He deceived her and left, went back to his family and she was left alone with a child, with a child. Sean couldn't believe it. So, you're Leo Murphy's illegitimate daughter. Is that it? She snorted. No. Thank God. I had a normal father who didn't abandon me. But my older brother. Yes. He's Leo Murphy's son. Illegitimate son. Sean felt dizzy. This was news. And more importantly, how to ask the boss about all this. It's hard to wrap his head around the idea that Leo could cheat on his beloved Alicia. So, did your mom tell you? She didn't tell me anything, Vivian said. I overheard their conversation with my brother. Tears glistened in the girl's eyes. At that moment, 
She felt so hurt for her mom that her heart simply broke into pieces. Vivian had been very close to her older brother since childhood. They had an eight-year age gap, and Cameron had practically been taking care of his sister since her birth. The boy loved his younger sister very much, and Vivian idolized her brother. They had such a wonderful family. A big, bear-like father, a beautiful and stately mother, and two friendly children. But when Vivian turned eight, she heard something that shook her belief in the family's perfection. Cameron was 16 at the time. The teenage years were taking their toll. The boy occasionally skipped school, came home late, and sometimes smelled of tobacco or even alcohol. Nothing supernatural, just a regular rebellious teenager. At one point, Cameron came home past midnight. His mother tried to talk to him. However, the audacious boy just brushed her off and rudely replied, Don't bother me. The father intervened. After a verbal altercation, he slapped Cameron. Vivian was already asleep, but she woke up hearing the sounds of the argument. Yawning, the girl came out of her room and witnessed a disgraceful scene. The beautiful and kind mother grabbed the hair of the big and strong father. Don't you dare hit my son, she hissed. You have no right to hit my son. Do you understand? The always calm father looked terrifying. Hearing his wife's words, he forcefully removed her hands from himself and looked at her with terrifying icy eyes. Your son. Yours. So, I'm only supposed to provide for, feed, clothe, and shoe your son. And you'll raise him yourself. Yes, myself. The mother breathed heavily staring at her husband with hatred. You're not his father, so you have no right to beat him. Little Vivian gasped in horror. Why was mom telling dad he wasn't Cameron's father? Why was she looking at him with such malice? What did it mean? Cameron, pale and confused, stood in the corner, his back against the wall. The teenager's lips trembled. At one point, he saw his sister, standing in the dark hallway, her eyes filled with tears. The boy immediately pulled himself together, worked past the arguing parents, picked up his sister, and carried her into the room. Don't worry, mom and dad just had a fight. Vivian nodded, afraid to ask the dreadful question. She didn't want to know why her mom said all these horrible things to her dad. But from that day on, the relationship between her parents began to deteriorate. Vivian heard more and more subdued arguments behind the closed bedroom door. Cameron, too, grew gloomier with each passing day. They used to be very close to their father, but now there seemed to be no trace of that friendship. The calm and kind mother became twitchy and nervous, and the father often disappeared from home for several days. Each such argument broke Vivian's heart all over again. If you don't love me, at least respect me. Have some conscience. I raised the boy since he was three, and you humiliate me in front of him because you shouldn't hit him. Don't come near him at all, you hear me. Somehow, I'll manage with my own son without you. You're nobody to him. Nobody. After a year of such life, the parents divorced. The father gathered his things and walked into his daughter's room with a sports bag in hand. He looked at Vivian for several long seconds then squatted down in front of her and hugged her tightly. The daughter felt that something irreversible was happening, and tears streamed down her cheeks. With his big warm hand, the father wiped her face and smiled. Don't cry. Don't cry, my dear. I won't live here anymore, but I'll come to see you often. All right. Vivian nodded, trying to hold back the sobs welling up inside her. After her father left, her mother remained in a state of shock for some time. She wandered around the house, doing something automatically, went to work, came back silently, cooked food, and went to bed. It seemed like she couldn't come to terms with the fact that the person who was ready to whisk her off her feet and carry her in his arms had so treacherously and irreversibly decided to leave her. However, despite everything, her mother eventually recovered. Cameron took on the main responsibilities for his sister. Leaving his teenage antics in the past, 
The boy diligently checked Vivian's homework, picked her up after school, and occasionally took her to the movies. He did everything to distract his little sister from the sudden changes. It was as if the teenager felt guilty for breaking up the family. If he hadn't talked back to his mother back then, his father wouldn't have lost his temper and hit him. And his mother wouldn't have said those offensive and frightening words to him. Father, as promised, indeed visited often, but he only interacted with Vivian, ignoring Cameron completely. From her brother's expression, the girl could see how hard he was taking the break with dad. Yet, as if to spite his ex-wife, the man strictly followed her instruction not to engage with his son. Vivian wasn't quite little anymore, so she was beginning to understand some things, but still didn't fully grasp why her mom and dad got divorced. When Vivian turned 12, something terrible happened. Her most beloved father, the one she adored above all else, passed away. The big, strong man went to sleep and never woke up. His heart stopped during the night. Neighbors found him quite quickly, but it was already too late to save him. Mom took the news of her ex-husband's death hard, but she didn't revert back to her post-divorce state. By that time, Cameron was already studying at a university in another city, but he came back for the funeral. Vivian, clinging to her brother, watched in horror as the damp clods of earth fell with a hollow thud into the grave. She cried softly. At some point, she felt something warm on her hand. Lifting her head, she saw tears streaming down Cameron's face too. It was then that Vivian first thought that her mom had acted very poorly, depriving her brother of his father, forbidding their dad from interacting with Cameron. After their father's departure, Vivian matured abruptly. She ceased to be the little princess spoiled by her caring father. The girl became more serious, but thankfully, her open and cheerful nature remained unchanged. She remained close to her brother and loved her somewhat distant mom just as much. Life went on. Cameron finished college but didn't return to their hometown. He took up shift work, only appearing at their parents' home once every six months. Several years later, Vivian finally realized that all this time her brother had been saving up to start his own business. About four years ago, Cameron and a friend opened a hotel, the very same Fox's Den. Vivian, who also managed to graduate from college, was offered the position of manager by her brother. She studied hotel management. Vivian enjoyed managing the hotel. Their mom, who had already retired, settled in one of the cottages on the Fox's Den property. It seemed that peace and tranquility had finally come to the family. On a regular spring day, Vivian finished dealing with paperwork and stepped out into the fragrant grounds of the hotel. Wandering along the pathways, she decided to visit her mom. As she approached the cottage, Vivian heard loud voices. Her heart raced. Instead of entering, for some reason, she quietly approached the window. Inside the house, her mom and brother were talking. Or rather, her mom was shouting while her brother tried to calm her down. Why? Why is he doing this to me? The woman sobbed, scattering bits of paper around her. All my life, I thought we just didn't work out, but he was playing with me. He had a wife, children. The mother rushed to the vanity table, abruptly opened a box standing there, and pulled out a brooch. He swore this was his keepsake. What a fool I am. Mom, mom, calm down. Cameron tightly embraced the woman, trying to restrain her hands. This is all in the past, but please, stop. The mother forcefully pushed her son away, and don't you calm me down. How about you? Do you enjoy any of this? That's what your father was like. Probably thought I wouldn't recognize his name. Ha, ha ha, he miscalculated. I'll find his wife and tell her everything. How he entertained himself here while she dealt with the kids. How he promised to marry me. How he kissed me. How, mom, why do you need this? Cameron, desperate, grabbed her hands again. Oh, why? I've spent half my life because of him. First, I waited for him to come. He promised, promised, promised. Swore his love, scoundrel. 
He said if I didn't want to leave, he'd come to me himself. But he never came. The mother broke free again and picked up a scrap of paper from the floor. Then she began to read aloud, loudly and sarcastically. Leo Murphy, professor of mathematical sciences. Leo has three children. The oldest son is a world-class expert in nuclear physics. Leo himself is a best-selling author. Imagine that. For several years now, topping the charts of the most popular detectives. Son, you see, your dad started writing books. And the first son, by the way, is older than you. The first son, so he was already there before he met me. How he lied to me here. The scoundrel. Tears streamed down the woman's face. Her son Cameron stood bewildered in the middle of the room, not knowing what to do. Vivian snapped out of it and quickly rushed into the house. Mom, what happened? She ran to her mother, but she pushed her away. Don't touch me. Nobody touch me. Life is just one big mistake. I've offended such a good person, and I couldn't even love him because that scoundrel was always like a fawn in my heart. And he doesn't care. He has three children a wife, and his books. That day was etched into Vivian's memory forever. Her mother cried, unable to calm down until late at night. Cameron couldn't bear what was happening and called an ambulance. The woman, hysterical, was given a sedative and the siblings sat down exhausted on the porch of the house. Cameron, what was that? Vivian looked at her brother with wide eyes. Nothing, Cameron said angrily. My biological father became a writer. Mom never searched for him, thought he overestimated his infatuation with her, so he never showed up again. She justified him all the time. And then we went to buy books for the living room, and among them was this detective. And at first, there was a brief biography of the author. But when Mom saw the surname, oh, anyway, it turns out, this Leo is my dad. He's living fine, with three grown children, all older than me, by the way. So, he deceived a naive small town girl and left back, and she remembered him all her life. How romantic it was and how wonderful. Vivian hung her head, so she didn't love my dad. She whispered. Cameron hugged his sister's shoulders. Well, in her own way, she did. Of course, it's just, you see, it's all very complicated. Vivian, she traced the rim of her glass with her finger and looked at her interlocutor. Sean, mom was so miserable. She cried all the time. Then she seemed to calm down. You know, not that she got better, but it's like she didn't care anymore. She was getting thinner and paler. She spoke little, ate little, often sat and stared into space. The girl glanced at Sean and six months later, you know, she just left, left, Sean asked. Yes, Vivian looked sharply at the man. She fell asleep and didn't wake up. And in the last months, it was as if she wasn't our mom anymore, but an empty shell. It's like this betrayal sucked out all her desire to live. She just wanted to disappear. Sean pondered, his head lowered. He already suspected who the sender of the package was, but didn't quite understand his motive yet. Vivian, you know, I think this is all just one big, huge misunderstanding. What do you mean? She furrowed her brows slightly, a hint of anger in her tone. Sean, are you going to defend your Leo again? The man hesitated. Not so much defend. I just think it wasn't him. Not him. Your brother Cameron's father. You understand, Vivian stood up. You know, Sean, let's stop. I understand that you're probably close to him, but I've told you about my family tragedy and I'm not going to listen to excuses for this man. Sean sighed, quickly paid the bill and hailed a taxi. They rode back in silence, each lost in their own thoughts. Vivian entered the hotel, bid Sean a curt goodbye and disappeared into the back room. Meanwhile, he went upstairs and knocked on Leo's door. There was no answer. Sean took out his phone and dialed. The subscriber was unavailable. The writer's assistant suddenly felt a chill run down his spine. While he was talking to Vivian, 
Leo was left alone in the hotel with that person who was writing the threatening notes. Was that really the case? Sean grabbed his head. Think. Think. What to do? Skipping steps. Sean dashed downstairs. He hurried back to the front desk. Hello. Please call Vivian. Sean requested. The receptionist looked at him in surprise. She's already gone home. It's her day off. Where does she live? The woman behind the counter smirked. Do you really think I'll give our manager's address to just anyone? No, of course not. I meant, how far does she live? I won't say. The woman crossed her arms over her chest. I'm begging you. This is a matter of life and death. Please contact her. Sean pleaded. The receptionist looked at the visibly pale man with skepticism. Meanwhile, Leo opened the door apartment. While Sean was absent, he continued to ponder what the note meant. As all clues pointed to Dwayne Carr, Leo tried to think logically. The only connection Dwayne had with this town was a business trip 35 years ago. Leo distinctly remembered that Dwayne came here by train, not by plane. Leo scrutinized the key with the built-in magnet. One crazy thought came to his mind. He grabbed his phone to call his assistant, but the assistant was unavailable. He's probably still talking to the girl. Leo thought, well, I'll just check. He called a taxi to the station. Walking through the spacious hall and reading the signs, Leo descended to the basement floor and found the room with the storage lockers. After another glance at the key, and finding no locker number, he took out the note from his pocket. In the corner of the paper, there was an indistinct number 79 embossed. Leo quickly located the locker with that number and nervously inserted the key. Frankly, the elderly man didn't have much hope. It was surprising that they still used regular keys here instead of electronic ones. Nevertheless, the door clicked open. Leo peered into the small compartment. There lay another note and another key. Leo sighed. So, he had to search for another suitable lock again. Nevertheless, the note simply said, it's time for you to remember everything, and an address was provided. Leo took the key and the piece of paper with the address. Then, after some thought, also grabbed the key to the locker. Calling a taxi once more, the elderly man gave the address indicated by the stranger. Soon, he found himself near a regular apartment building. Leo got out of the car, found the right entrance, and cautiously climbed the stairs. His heart pounded in his chest. Leo considered calling his assistant again, but when he took out his phone, it was just showing a black screen. His battery had died. All white. The man thought, approaching the door. Either way, everything will be fine. He unlocked the door and stepped into the darkness. Meanwhile, Vivian reappeared at the reception desk. The expression on her face didn't bode well. Will you leave me alone or not? She hissed to Sean, pulling him away from the curious administrator. I am not going to listen to anything about that scoundrel Leo Murphy. Do you understand? And why do you need it? This whole story doesn't concern you at all. Sean listened to the girl and sighed. Listen, Vivian, if you love your brother Cameron, then, well, right now, he might be about to commit a crime. I can't assert that, but what nonsense are you talking about? Vivian's cheeks flushed. Cameron is going to. This is absurd. My brother is the kindest person. Know that. Well, what if he decides to take revenge for your mother? How so? Vivian snorted. Unless he informs his wife, Leo's wife, about how her husband cheated on her here a hundred years ago. I'm afraid it's not that harmless. Listen to me. Sean briefly told the girl about the mysterious package, the keys, and the notes. You see, Vivian, after your story, I'm almost sure that your brother Cameron who considers my boss his biological father, is behind all this. Vivian stared at the floor, clearly trying to gather her thoughts. Cameron couldn't, and why, and what to do. Oh God, but he's not going to kill him, is he? The girl clasped her hands to her burning cheeks. Vivian, Sean reached out and gently took her by the shoulder. Please, think, just think. 
Where could he have lured his alleged father? Stop calling him alleged. The girl snapped angrily. It's obvious that your boss committed a sin. It's not worth defending him. She paused. But, still, it can't be. I, I think I know. And Sean looked hopefully at Vivian, our old apartment. Mom lived there since childhood. And if they ever met Leo some wee many years ago, then, probably, it's there. All right. Tell me the address. Sean grabbed his phone to call a taxi. I'll go with you, she said grimly. If Cameron is really there, well, I'll be able to talk to him. Yes, all right. The man nodded. Let's go. Leo ran his hand along the wall in search of a light switch. A light bulb flickered to life on the ceiling. Leo glanced around. It was a simple, slightly dusty hallway. An old coat hung on the rack. Several pairs of worn-out slippers lined the shoe shelf. The writer, after some thought, took off his shoes and slowly worked deeper into the apartment. Turning on the lights everywhere, signs of neglect were evident. The stale smell of an uninhabited space, faded wallpaper, and worn-out upholstery on the couch. In the large room, family photos adorned the walls. A graceful woman with wavy hair, a tall, burly bearded man, a boy around 10 years old, and a tiny girl in a floral dress and a Panama hat. They all smiled. Happiness and sunlight radiated from the photo. But Leo didn't know any of these people. What am I even doing in this stranger's apartment? The man thought, entering another room. Here, on the table, standing out from the general picture of abandoned living, was a brand new glossy suitcase with a magnetic lock. Leo tremblingly reached into his pocket and pulled out the key to the locker with a built-in magnet. Good thing I took it, he thought, opening the suitcase. Inside was a chubby envelope, along with some old cologne and a thick notebook with a blue cover. The writer began to flip through the pages of the notebook. The sheets were covered with neat, large handwriting. Leo read through several entries. It seemed to be a young girl's diary. There were entries about defending her thesis. Then some poems copied from a magazine, sketches of dresses the diary's author dreamed of. Flipping through, Leo suddenly came across a yellowed conference program. The man unfolded the paper. There it was, the same conference that Wayne Carr had attended. Instead of Leo Murphy, unable to stand any longer, the elderly man sank onto the creaky chair. He suddenly realized clearly that there had been some catastrophic misunderstanding all those years ago. Leo recalled his best friend's joyful voice once again. I met someone. It's for real. I'll tell you later. Leo carefully examined the program. The only speaker listed from their university was Murphy L. Well, of course, no one would bother reprinting the program. Leo thought much was still unclear. But as he read the diary entries, the man realized one thing. The girl simply mistook Dwayne for him. For Leo. What do you think? Diary. Does fate exist? Wrote the young girl. I believe it does. Otherwise, how can you explain this meeting? When I saw him, I immediately remembered my dreams. And he was definitely in my dreams. Just as vivid, sunny, and familiar. You know. Diary. He just approached. Before he could say anything, I already knew that life would never be the same. Leo wiped his eyes. Lord, she's so young, so enthusiastic. What a pity. He said, my dear princess, do you need a knight? And I said, only if there's a dragon I need protection from. And then, diary, you won't believe it. A watering truck passed by, and he covered me with him. He was all wet, and I was laughing so hard. Dwayne, what a fool you are, Leo muttered, reading a few more pages. Leo felt terribly awkward, as if he were intruding on something very personal, very intimate. But if he hadn't read it, he wouldn't have understood why this misunderstanding had occurred. So, that summer, Dwayne Carr met Sophia at the entrance to the train station in some old northern town. Perhaps it was love at first sight, because the 34-year-old man suddenly started acting like a crazy, 
ardent youth. Apparently, Sophia also immediately liked Wayne. The girl played along with him. During their brief romantic acquaintance, Dwayne called Sophia princess, and she called him my knight. Leo slapped his forehead. Dwayne, if you were suddenly to come back to life right now, I would personally beat you. Leo fought. We walked until sunrise. In the morning, he had to sit through a boring conference, and he didn't even go to sleep. The diary's entries continued. When the sky turned pink, he kissed me and ran off, only to return a few minutes later with a bouquet of forget-me-nuts. Lord, where did he find them? Between the pages lay a dried and yellowed, but carefully preserved, little bouquet. The two lovers maintained the princess and knight game for a whole week. Dwayne swore eternal love to Sophie and, as a sign of fidelity, gave his princess his mother's most precious treasure, a brooch. In general, Dwayne didn't deliberately conceal his identity. It's just that two burning hearts liked the Featrix. It was a romance where there was only him and her. If Sophie had asked her knight what his name was, he would have certainly answered. But, stories don't have subjunctive mood. So, Dwayne assured the princess that right after the conference, he would come to her. Either he would take Sophie with him, or he would stay with her here. Reading the chronicles of times past, Leo involuntarily remembered Dwayne's nature. A romantic, but he had never truly fallen in love. In Sophie, he apparently saw exactly the woman with whom he was ready to spend his whole life. Well, once upon a time, Leo himself fell in love at first sight with his Alicia. He gave me this bunch of grapes as a symbol of his love. My knight. His hand was shaking when he gave me the brooch. He said it was the only thing left from his mom. I also don't have a mom. I can't imagine how precious this thing must have been for him, wrote the girl. Sophie accepted the proposal of her unnamed knight, and after mutual confessions between the young people, something else happened. Well, who could resist when their beloved was nearby? The air was fragrant with summer herbs, and the moon was so gentle. Leo blushed slightly, stumbling upon mention of that night in the diary. He quickly flipped through, not paying attention to the description. Leaving some things with Sophie, Dwayne went to the final event of the conference. Namely, to that very fishing trip, he said there was a little left. They need to finish their business at the conference, and then we'll decide together what to do next. I have no regrets about anything. Now I understand that I've never felt these feelings for anyone before. I thought we needed to go a long way together for love to grow out of mutual respect and friendship. Who knew that love doesn't need any conditions at all? It either exists or it doesn't. Even when I just think about him, my heart sweetly stops and shivers run through my body. All my past crushes turned out to be false. Leo knew what happened to Dwayne afterward, but Sophie didn't. She honestly awaited her night, but he never showed up. In Sophie's apartment remained her lover's jacket, trousers, and shoes. In the jacket pocket, she found a conference program from which Sophie learned the name of her knight. After all, Dwayne willingly told his future wife that he worked at one of the best universities. And from this university, only one person was speaking. Oh yes, you'd better have said your name, fool, than boast about the university exclaimed Leo. Next in the diary were reflections on what mistake she, Sophie, could have made for her night, because he not to return to her. Then there were entries full of despair when she learned about her pregnancy. The girl struggled for a long time, but remained true to her desire to keep the child of her beloved man. The diary ended with a very poignant entry. Now I know for sure that he won't come back. I don't want to believe that he intentionally deceived me. I think he just believed that such strong feelings couldn't arise spontaneously. Or maybe I just loved him more than he loved me. Anyway, I'm grateful to fate for giving me my little miracle. I don't want to regret our meeting. I will always remember our little fairy tale. Leo put aside the diary. I'll write. Well, more like, bad. It's a very sad story. But the girl didn't harbor any malice in the end. 
Where is she now? Did she initiate this strange game? Leo took out the envelope and pulled out its contents. There was a letter addressed to his wife on several sheets. It detailed the passionate romance of Duane, under the guise of Leo, with Sophie. The author opened Alicia's eyes to her unfaithful husband, as well as informed her that the damn scoundrel Leo, besides their three legitimate children, also had an illegitimate son. Excerpts from the diary and a copy of the brochure were provided as evidence. A separate sheet contained a message specifically for Leo. Well, Mr. Detective, our little game has come to an end. Just at the time when you were sitting in this long abandoned apartment, your wife is reading the details of your long-standing infidelity. Funny, isn't it? Sorry for disturbing you and calling you all the way here, but I think my mother had it much worse than you. I sincerely pity your wife. She's not guilty of anything and I hope she refuses to continue family life with a monster like you. All the best to you, the old man. Leo reread this note in astonishment. So, Alicia is now reading completely unfounded accusations of infidelity against her beloved husband. Leo jumped up. Damn it, Dwayne, I love you very much. But you, you're a complete idiot. At that moment, the front door swung open. Sean, out of breath, stood in the doorway, followed by an agitated Vivian. Boss, are you all right? Nothing is all right, Leo said bitterly. We've got an unexpected visitor here, Dwayne Carr's previously unknown son. He's quite angry and vengeful. What do you mean, Dwayne? Vivian snapped. And where's Cameron? He, he hasn't done anything to you, has he? He most certainly has. Leo rudely began searching his assistant's pockets. Give me your phone. Mine died. Sean silently handed his boss his phone. Leo quickly dialed his wife's number, and she answered after the first ring. Where is that jerk? She asked coldly. Leo helplessly glanced at Sean and turned away. Well, I guess the jerk is me. Why is your phone off? Alicia asked in the same icy tone. It died. Alicia. Listen, no, you listen. Did you hire security to keep rumors of your infidelity from reaching me? There was no infidelity. It's all a huge misunderstanding. Dwayne, what about Dwayne? Dwayne Carr, who died many years ago. Are you trying to blame your late best friend? Alicia sighed deeply. Okay, I need to cool down. Don't show up here for at least a few days. But I didn't. But the line was already silent. Leo's wife hung up. Leo, don't worry. Your wife is a very smart woman. And right now she'll think. Compare timelines. And will someone tell me what's going on or not? Vivian finally interjected. Sean soothingly potted her hand. Of course, of course. I'll explain everything right now. Leo irritably paced around the room. No. First I need to meet with this so-called son of mine. If we don't clear things up, he might keep causing trouble. I mean, he threatened my family. Dragged me here. Made me hire security. I suggested calling the police. Sean interjected. Not right now. The elderly man waved off. How do we find this so-called son then? Vivian. Casting her eyes down, murmured, I think I can arrange a meeting. Leo glared menacingly at the girl. And who might you be? My legitimate daughter. Sean shot a reproachful glance at his boss and shielded Vivian with his body. Leo, don't attack her. She's not guilty of anything. The writer subdued his anger somewhat and sighed. Fine, let's figure something out. Two hours later, a nervous Leo, fidgeting in his chair, sat at a table in a downtown restaurant. Sean sat beside him, sneaking glances at the entrance. Finally, Vivian arrived, leading the same man she had been embracing in the hotel lobby that morning. The stranger's face displayed a disgusted expression. He clearly didn't want to be here. Leo suddenly stopped fidgeting and stared at the disgruntled man sitting across from him. He looked at the unfamiliar man with curiosity which only further irritated him. Why are you staring? The man snapped. You look a lot like Dwayne. Leo said suddenly, his eyes flashing with sadness. 
What a pity. How sad that it all turned out this way. The man snorted and turned to Vivian. I told you he'd resist to the end and come up with some nonsense. He said, disdainfully looking back at Leo. Don't worry. I won't ask you to acknowledge me as your legitimate son. I don't need such a father. So let's just finish this unnecessary and unpleasant meeting. Vivian grabbed her brother's hand. Cameron, calm down. Don't you want to listen? Please, just try to listen. For me, the man rolled his eyes but remained seated. Leo smirked. He was still angry at this stubborn guy who had brought him so much trouble. But he was Dwayne's son, and Leo had to tell him everything. The writer took out his phone and scrolled through the photos in his gallery. Finding the one he needed, he brought the smartphone closer to Cameron. Here, look, Dwayne Carr, my best friend. That's him, your father. Cameron looked at the photo with disbelief. Vivian, sitting next to him, gasped. Cameron, you look so much like him. The man still couldn't easily adjust. So you were saying your friend used your name and had an affair with my mom. Are you insane? And he left her pregnant. Not you. No, he didn't use my name at all. Did you even read your mom's diary? They didn't even tell each other their names. Dear Cameron, but he mentioned he was speaking at a conference and named a university. And there was only one name, yours. Leo took back the phone and scrolled through the gallery again. He placed the phone in front of Cameron once more. Here we are together, shortly before that conference. Then Leo, pausing and sighing, recounted the whole story. The absurd, foolish, romantic tale that ended with two tragedies. Dwayne's death and, many years later, Sophie's demise. If it weren't for this misunderstanding with the names, Leo leaned his head on his fist. Sophie would have considered her encounter with Dwayne fateful and romantic her whole life. When she found out he was supposedly already married with children, it shattered her. It's very difficult when your ideals are shattered. Cameron suddenly blushed and jumped up. Oh my God, forgive me if you can. I, I'll go with you. I'll kneel before your wife and explain everything to her. She'll believe me. We can do a DNA test with you. It'll show that I'm not your son. Leo just smiled. I think Kalisha has already put it all together and understood. I've blamed myself for Dwayne's death all my life. Of course, she remembers the year it happened. You were in that sitter that year, Sean said. After Dwayne's death, Leo, remember, Leo went pale, that's right. He grabbed Cameron's hand. Okay, you are coming with me, son. Do whatever you want, but prove to Alicia that I didn't betray her. Sean smiled subtly and looked at Vivian. The girl also suppressed a smile. The next day, dressed warmly, all four loaded into Cameron's SUV and set off out of town. Leo periodically remembered something directing the way. After an hour's drive, the three men and the girl got out of the car. Walking between the trees for about 500 meters through deep drifts, they reached the gentle bank of the river. This is it. Leo looked around and approached a white snowdrift. He began to clear away the snow, revealing the gray surface of a granite obelisk. Dwayne Carr. It read on the plaque. Best friend. Wonderful person. Talented scholar. Below was the date of Dwayne's death and his small black and white photo in an oval frame. Cameron approached the obelisk with a tight feeling in his chest. The person in the old photo looked very much like himself. The man who once loved his mother. The man who gave life to Cameron. The man who foolishly lost his life. If it weren't for a chain of misunderstandings, not for the naive game of two lovers, perhaps fate would have unfolded differently. Perhaps upon learning of her beloved's death, Sophie would have grieved but could have let go and loved her second husband without falling into such despair at the thought of betrayal. And he, Cameron, wouldn't have been infected with the idea of terrible revenge and wouldn't have troubled the elderly writer on his 70th birthday. Cameron grabbed a handful of snow and rubbed his burning face. And I'm still angry. Leo put his hand on Cameron's shoulder but the whole situation is the result of a colossal mistake. 
and you shouldn't blame yourself. Besides, I'm glad Dwayne left a mark on this earth. Cameron gratefully nodded to the writer. You're the mark. Got it. Vivian whispered to her brother. Oh, come on. Cameron waved off his sister with a smile. Suddenly, an unprecedented lightness filled his soul. Like when the sky clears after being covered with dark clouds. The four of them stood on the shore for a long time, each lost in their own thoughts. Vivian shivered slightly and began to tremble. Sean quickly took off his scarf and draped it over the girl. On the other side, there was an indignant snort. Cameron swapped Sean's scarf for his own and handed the man back his item. Thanks. We'll manage on our own. Sean sighed and subtly shook his head. Looking at Vivian's retreating eyes, another day passed. And Leo, feeling guilty without reason, stood by the closed gates of his own home, trying to throw a snowball at the window. Sean and Cameron were standing beside him. Vivian, who had followed her brother, had cozily settled in the warm car. Alicia, Leo shouted, throwing another snowball that softly hit the glass. Open up, call off the guards. A soft silhouette with white hair appeared in the window. The woman cracked it open. You hired the guards yourself. Deal with it yourself. Alicia closed the window again and Leo kicked the snowbank, who knew she could give orders to the guards and not let me in. Sean shrugged. He didn't really believe that the boss's wife could stay angry for so long. Sean had been observing the couple from the sidelines for several years and had come to understand a few things. Yes, Alicia sometimes scolded her husband, and he, being an absolute pushover, always complied. But there was such a strong bond between them that no misunderstanding could break it. The gate suddenly opened. The impassive face of one of the guards appeared. Alicia said you can come in. Ha ha. Hooray. Leo, like a child, shoved the burly man in black aside and dashed towards the house with an agility uncommon for his age. Sean opened the car door, offering Vivian his hand. Are you sure our presence will be appropriate? Vivian whispered to Sean. Of course, Sean replied. The more people, the less likely it is that the boss's wife will go ballistic. And they all slowly made their way to the house. Alicia greeted her husband standing in the doorway. So, in short, I brought the culprit of all this commotion with me. Her husband quickly informed her, nodding behind him. Alicia, we'll explain everything to you quickly now. I hope so. The woman smirked, ushering the guests into the house. An hour later, they were all sitting in the living room, examining an album of old photographs. And this is our first anniversary after the wedding. Alicia, wiping away tears, pointed to a black and white picture. Dwayne is already drunk here. You see, he's hugging the bush. I think he even proposed to this bush then. Overall, Cameron, if it weren't for Dwayne, Maybe Leo and I would never have gotten together. He's our Cupid. Can you imagine? The woman sniffled, and her husband gently hugged her shoulders. Alicia, don't cry, Leo said. Yo, don't cry if you don't want to. She snapped. I've just met Dwayne's son. I have the right to be emotional. Oh, well, let's have dinner. I have a bottle of champagne in the fridge. I think such a miracle should be celebrated. After all, Dwayne Carr, and so many years later, and the woman went to set the table. Vivian joined her in the kitchen, while the three men remained in the empty living room. Cameron drummed his fingers on the armrest. You're Sean, right? The assistant, lost in thought, startled. Yeah, he cautiously looked at Cameron. Listen, Sean, I hope you haven't set your sights on my sister. Sean shrugged and smiled dreamily triggering a bout of heartburn in Cameron. Sean, I warned you, Cameron added disapprovingly. All right, guys, don't fight, Leo muttered. It's good to be young, the writer thought to himself. Vivian peeked out cautiously from the kitchen, listening. She grimaced upon hearing her brother's grumbling and frowned when there was no response from Sean. Humph. The girl snorted and went back into the kitchen. Just don't take our Sean away to your north, Alicia said with a smile. 
You'd better move here yourself. Vivian flared up. Me. Why should I suddenly take him with me? We just met, and I'm not interested anyway. Alicia gestured to stop Vivian and shook her head. Still smiling. Girl, listen. When you've lived for many years, like me, many things become obvious to you. Sometimes you don't even need to look closely to understand everything. Vivian fell silent, lowering her head. Alicia glanced at the blushing Vivian and nodded to herself. On a hot summer day, two years later, a handsome man approached the gentle river bank carrying a tiny baby, who was probably no more than six months old, in his arms. He ran his hand over the gray plaque, and this is a memory of your grandfather, he said, looking into his baby's face. Now, say grandpa, come on, say it. Next, you'll ask him to say synchrotron. Give the kid a break and come here, into the shade. A tall red head emerged from behind the trees. The man immediately followed her. Several people were sitting in the shade of thick foliage on a round clearing. Cameron approached and handed the baby to the redhead. Go to mommy, buddy, he said affectionately, and plopped down on a log. Shall we make a fire? Oh, it's so hot this summer. Vivian, leaning against a tree, swept a strand of wavy hair from her face. Cameron, it's better not to risk it. We don't want to cause a forest fire. We have plenty of ready-made food. Well, sis, I'm not insisting. Cameron shrugged. I want a drink, Vivian said petulantly. Sean immediately rushed to her and handed her a dewy bottle of water. The girl gently caressed her round belly and smiled. Thank you, darling. Sean, I heard Leo released a new book, Cameron asked. Yes, he did. Another bestseller. The plot is incredible. A mysterious villain lose and kidnaps the father who abandoned his mother. Oh. I see. That's enough. That's enough. Cameron rolled his eyes. You're making this up now. Vivian perked up. Cameron, he's not making it up. Seriously, such a plot. Look it up online. There's a book for sale called Three Keys to Death. The redhead chuckled. All right. Enough laughing, Cameron said. Above the clearing, the sound of youthful laughter rang out. The leaves of the tree swayed gently but the breeze couldn't dispel the summer heat. Do you think if Dwayne hadn't? Well, if he had stayed alive, would he have married his princess? Alicia was watering flowers in the garden while Leo worked on something wooden nearby. Of course, he would have. You might not know this, but he always told me he would know right away when he met the one. That's why he didn't get into any serious relationships. Just went to the movies with girls occasionally or hung out. Leo said, oh, what a pity. Alicia sighed sadly. Just imagine, they would have been happy. Dwayne would have probably moved up north. He would have become a renowned professor there, raising his son. Or Sophie would have moved here, and we would have become friends with her. Don't be sad. If everything had turned out that way, Vivian wouldn't exist in this world. And now Sean would have remained perpetually single or he would have ended up with some shrew, Leo said, trying to lighten the mood, listening to her husband. Alicia couldn't help but interject. Why are you laughing? We can't change the past, but we can build the present. Oh, by the way, dear, speaking of building, when are Sean and Vivian coming back? Their house will be finished soon, Alicia asked. I think it's in about a week. Vivian is due to give birth in October. She needs to take it easy. Alicia replied, a round, fragrant apple fell heavily from the apple tree onto the ground. Look, Leo, apples are falling. Autumn is coming soon, Alicia said thoughtfully. Have you ever thought that we'll spend the autumn of our lives together? I've always been sure of that. Well, not just until autumn, my dear, until the very late winter. Leo responded tenderly to his wife.